this is, um, so I was asked to sort of give an overview of, of POTS. Um, so it's by necessity going to be um, a review for some of you. I, I suspect some of you uh, know a lot about this already, but hopefully we'll, we'll catch some of the newer patients up to speed. Um, and then we will happy to try and address some of the questions, but not the 200 that Bob's dealing with. Hopefully he'll, he'll take care of all the questions while I'm chatting. So, um, so the what is it, right? I mean, so fundamentally POTS is, is a syndrome. It's, it's not a thing, it's a cluster of things, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but it's a syndrome defined by clinical characteristics. And the characteristics, uh, the most prominent one, I guess the easy to see one, um, is an excessive orthostatic tachycardia. So the heart rate jumps up too much on standing. Um, the exact thresholds vary, as you can see here, based on age, because physiologically this happens, right? An increase in heart rate on standing is not abnormal. In fact, a lack of an increase in heart rate on standing is abnormal. The issue here is that the POTS patients just do it better than the average person. Um, and it can get high enough that it actually starts causing its own problems. This has to occur in the absence of orthostatic hypotension. Inevitably, it these meetings, I'll get someone saying that they have both and they get upset that you say, you know, that you can't define POTS that way. And it's not to say that if you have orthostatic hypotension that you don't have something real, you very much do. It's just that we call that orthostatic hypotension and you, with, with a lot of the orthostatic hypotension, one of the things we look for is an increase in heart rate or reflex tachycardia. So we don't sort of label that as POTS as well. POTS is, is specifically when you don't have that already. That's physiology, right? This is stuff, if those of you that have had a tilt table test, for example, can go to the tilt lab and they can give you this information. But that's not enough for diagnosis of POTS, right? For diagnosis of POTS, it's a syndrome. A clinical syndrome means that um, there are symptoms and there are characteristic symptoms and a bunch of patients look like this other group of patients. And so what we wanna see for the diagnosis is that there are symptoms that are worse with upright posture um, and we'll get into what some of those are specifically, and, and not everyone has every one, but, but basically there's symptoms that are worse upright that get better when you're recumbent or when you're lying down. And finally, and this is important, um, this has to be chronic. Um, so when, when any of us get sick with, with a regular cold, and, and now there's a lot more attention and interest with, with COVID that sort of affected us all a lot more than I think any of us expected a couple of years ago, um, Acutely, a lot of people will have the first three things. You can have the excessive orthostatic tachycardia. You can have, in the absence of the hypotension, you can have a lot of symptoms when you're upright to get better when you lie down, but usually it goes away. Um, the problem is that in patients with POTS, it doesn't. And, and we're seeing that in some of the patients after COVID um, as well, right? But, but it's a chronic disorder. We typically have used six months. Some people use three months. The truth is it probably doesn't matter. What we're trying to avoid are the, the few weeks uh, to a month where you may still be getting over an acute illness. This slide uh, lists some of the common symptoms. It's not an exhaustive list and it's broken down into symptoms that as a cardiologist, I can relate back to being related, you know, caused by the heart on the left and symptoms on the right that I really have trouble blaming on the heart directly. So stuff like the rapid palpitation, the racing, the chest discomfort, pain sometimes, shortness of breath, lightheadedness. These are all symptoms that I think most of us can say could be directly heart related. Um, but a lot of patients have um, problem with concentration or memory, mental clouding, brain fog. Um, a high percentage, over 90% have headaches, nausea is common, and a tremulousness or inner shakiness is common, especially when upright. Probably not heart related. The symptoms on top here in black are symptoms that tend to get worse when you're standing up as a POTS patient. But there are some symptoms that aren't as positional. So the ones on the bottom, the exercise intolerance, fatigue, sleep problems, they obviously can occur in a non-operative position. So not all the symptoms in POTS get better when you lie down, right? But there has to be a preponderance of these other symptoms. This is a, a slide just showing a tilt table test. It's from a report from a while ago now. Um, shows a healthy subject on the right and a POTS patient on the left. And, there are three channels. The heart rate is shown on the top, the blood pressure in the middle, and the bottom is just when the table went up, you can sort of see when the table went up and came down. If you focus on the control subject first on the right, the important things to notice are, one, the heart rate goes up when we tilt them up, right? Remember, orthostatic tachycardia is physiologic. It's normal to have some. 
But if you look at the POTS patient on the left, there are a couple of things to note. The first is if you look at the blood pressure channel, it's hard to argue the blood pressure, the average blood pressure is much different in the POTS patient than the control subject, right? I mean, on average, the pressure looks sort of the same. Now, those careful observers may look at the POTS blood pressure tracing and say that looks different. You know, one could argue that looks like sort of I do when my hair grows out and I'm having a bad hair day. Um, while the control subject is a little more controlled and that actually might be important, right? That pattern of blood pressure variability may tell us something, but, but fundamentally not a blood pressure problem. But if you look at the heart rate, the heart rate goes up. You can say, well, it did in the control subject as well, but see how much it went up. It went up aggressively early and kept going up. And in this particular POTS patient, we put the table down before the 30 minutes that we, we should have done by protocol because the patient said they'd had enough. And when they had enough, her heart rate was actually about 180 beats a minute, right? And that's just with standing. Right? So again, an excessive orthostatic tachycardia is really the hallmark of this. But remember I said symptoms are important in, this, in that same study where we had collected those tilts, we actually rated symptoms every few minutes. Um, you can see in the control subjects in black, for the most part, they're asymptomatic. Every once in a while, they get a little bit symptomatic or someone would, they'd faint, they'd drop out and the symptoms would go back down to zero. The POTS patients, in contrast, became symptomatic early on and they remained symptomatic. In fact, you know, one of the key differences is the POTS patients would tell us from the first few minutes of tilt that they were about to faint. And they kept telling us that for 30 minutes, right? And that raises an important point and that is POTS is not primarily a fainting disorder. POTS is actually a disorder where people feel like fainting. They feel faint. They don't necessarily faint. In fact, in this particular study, a higher percentage of the healthy control subjects, Vanderbilt grad students at the time, fainted or didn't make it through the 30 minute tilt because of fainting than the POTS patients. So more of the POTS patients actually made it through without fainting than our healthy subjects here. Right, so not a fainting disorder per se. That's not to say some POTS patients don't also faint, but it's a minority and, and that mechanism is usually vasovagal syncope, which you just heard about. So um, I'm gonna present a little bit of data from um, our sort of big POTS survey. So the, the first paper was sort of trying to really describe what POTS looks like. Um, and there, there's other uh, bits and bobs in this paper, some of which you're gonna, I think, hear about in, during this meeting. Um, but this is a study that uh, is a, consisted of a long online survey. I know many of you probably participated in it and, and we thank you because this has given us a chance to really see what POTS looks like outside of small tertiary care centers, which is where a lot of our physiologic data has come from. So the survey launched uh, back in 2015. Um, there have been different data closes. This is from the first tranche that was in this, in this published paper already. Um, we required patients uh, that filled out the survey to tell us the inclusion criteria was they had to have a physician diagnosis of POTS. Obviously, we weren't verifying the diagnoses ourselves. Despite that, we then asked actually in the survey, did a physician diagnose you with POTS? And we actually had a, a reasonable number of patients that said no to the second one. And so we excluded them from this analysis here. So what we see here is that you know, it turns out that what we've learned in the smaller studies is pretty much correct. POTS, at least the people filling out the survey, overwhelmingly female. In this study, over 95% female. And not just female, there, there are Caucasian females or white females. There was uh, a small smattering of uh, African Americans and Asians. And, uh, you know, we actually had more mixed than any other group besides white. Reasons for this aren't clear. We can sort of speculate, um, but that's who filled out the survey. We looked at the age of onset, and obviously depending on if you're a pediatrician or you're an adult physician, you see different parts of this spectrum. But the, there are two interesting things here. One is that it was about a 50-50 split actually between those patients that developed their POTS under the age of 18 versus over. It was just a little over 50% for the under 18. Um, and then the other thing was the mode or the most common age for the onset of their POTS and people completing this was 14, right? So there's a big swath that occurs around puberty, but it's not all about puberty. There's actually a good portion of the population that develops their POTS later. And, and these may or may not be due to the same causes. 
across this age spectrum. We asked about common symptoms and you know, some of the symptoms described by almost everyone are the ones you'd expect, lightheadedness, tachycardia, um, but there are others that were very commonly reported that aren't as clearly related to tachycardia. Um, headache was present in over 90%. Difficulty concentration was in over 90%. Nausea uh, and memory problems in almost 90%, right? So there are some very distinctly non-cardiac sounding symptoms that are critically important as well. Um, just a word about education. I mean, one of the, the challenges is if over half the population develops this in their teenage years or before the age of 18, these are the years when um, we're supposed to be in school, our kids are supposed to be in school, and they're really um, setting the trajectory, the path for the rest of their life. Um, and the effects of POTS on education are concerning, right? very concerning. So we found that almost 90% of the patients described missing some school. Um, you know, the odd day off here and there, not necessarily a horrible thing, but this was more than that, right? So almost 30% um, actually had to be homeschooled because they weren't able to actually function in school. 25% had to drop out of school at one point or another. Um, and almost 40% um, had their university education derailed in some way. So either they postponed enrollment, de you know, deferred altogether, or um, had some form of delay in their education related to their, their uh, illness. So huge impacts on education. And, and I think this speaks to the importance of trying to really um, get some effective treatment early, right? Because it's, it's not just a matter of getting treatment eventually, but, but this particular time in one's life arguably is, is, is more critical than almost any other. Um, many of you may have uh, been confronted by doctors arguing that this is, you know, all a psychiatric issue, that POTS is all in your head. Um, and so we actually looked at this at Vanderbilt years ago, and, and that was actually my wife, um, who was a research fellow in psychiatry at the time, that did some of this work. Um, and they did a fairly detailed study of patients that came to see us at the Vanderbilt Autonomic Dysfunction Center, where they administered uh, a structured uh, tool to map symptoms to, at the for time it was DSM-4 TR, I think, I think we're now on DSM-5 something, um, but basically mapped to sort of psychiatric illnesses using their Bible. And what we found was that compared to the general population, there wasn't a higher rate of major depression, anxiety disorders, or panic disorders in POTS patients. That's not to say that none of the patients had any of these disorders, they did, but if you look at the population as a whole, this exists as well. It wasn't uh, present at a higher level. There were various psychometric tools administered, but the one thing that popped out as, as interesting um, that led us to some other work trying to understand brain fog better was this. So this is the Connors um, attention, adult uh, attention deficit rating scale, the inattention score. So this is an ADHD rating scale. Um, so we have a few groups here. This were, these were, uh, the, the people deemed to be psychiatrically normal. Um, these were uber normals, just so you know, right? So there was a screening to qualify as normal. Um, Vidya pointed out quite cheerfully that I did not qualify as normal. So take that for what it's worth. Um, but that was a normal value. The, the ADHD patients obviously scored highly on this, right? That, that's one of the key features of ADHD is an attention. But importantly, the POTS patients actually were significantly worse than both normals and perhaps a more important comparative population is the, is the sort of general population. So background data from about the US general population. And there was a higher rate of inattention, right? And this got us thinking that maybe some of the brain fog um, when people complained of memory problems wasn't necessarily memory, um, but some of it may have been an attention concentration issue. Um, and this is the, the first finding that sort of set us uh, along the path of looking into that a bit further. Um, the anxiety question actually was addressed very nicely in this study out of the Mayo Clinic, um, where they took POTS patients and control subjects. The POTS patient data is the darker black on top as opposed to the gray or thinner black, if you will, on the bottom. And what they found is, what they did is they took patients and put them in a lower body negative pressure box, right? So this is basically a way of simulating um, standing up, an orthostatic challenge, 
by sucking blood into the legs, right? And, and there are different levels of fancy technology, a version of this lower body naked pressure LBMP box that we used uh, when I was a fellow here in Calgary two decades ago, um, our medical vacuum device was an old Electrolux vacuum cleaner. So literally we just sort of sucked air out of the bottom half of the body. The, the bottom half of the body was sort of in this enclosed chamber, sucks blood to the legs and that simulates standing and you can look at stuff. And they did. And what they found is that the POTS patients started with a higher heart rate than the control subjects, not surprisingly. And when you started stressing them with more and more suction, and you see here how much suction there is, that the heart rate went up in the control subjects as blood got sucked to their legs, but it went up more aggressively. It went up faster into higher levels in the POTS patients. The blood pressure, on the other hand, was basically comparable and um, relatively unchanged with this um, maneuver. Now, the clever thing they did is they actually did this twice. They did this um, just plainly, um, but they actually had patients wearing what are called mast pants. So these are old um, uh, inflation pants that they used to use in ambulances, for example, and in battlefields if you had long bone injuries. So if you broke your leg, they're pants you could put on and then inflate and they provide effectively um, like an air cast for the lower limbs, right? So it's a little air shield around the legs that protect the legs from the outer environment. So they did the same study with the mass pants inflated. So now the legs don't feel that suction because they have their own little air barrier around it. And what they found is that when you eliminated the suction, even though you had all the noise and other stuff going on, that the heart rate didn't go up, right? And this really sort of drove home the point that the heart rate increased as a response to physiology, in this case, the fluid shifting away from the heart um, and not anxiety because in both cases, there's a lot of noise and other medical things happening. So I think we sort of covered this. So the key thing is that not the POTS patients are immune from psychiatric illness. It does exist. And if it exists, it should be treated. Um, but they're not more prone to it than the general population as a group. What about quality of life? So this is not our data. Uh, this is data collected using a very generic quality of life tool called the SF36. Um, it has strengths and weaknesses. You know, it's, 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 because it's generic, it's not really specific to any disorder and you, don't, you may miss things that are important in POTS patients, for example. But because it's generic, that also means that it's been studied in just about every disorder. And so it's good for comparing across disease states and other disorders. And the data here uh, broken into sort of physical health subscores and mental health subscores are presented for two disorders that are viewed as having a pretty crummy quality of life. Patients with chronic back pain in green and patients um, on dialysis because of end-stage renal disease in purple. And these are the data for our POTS patients superimposed on here, right? So it's just to give you an idea that the quality of life for whatever reason um, sucks. Right, the you know patients are perceived self-perceived quality of life, both in mental and physical domains, are very poor in POTS patients, and I think it speaks to the need to to try and find ways of fixing it. Um, this slide at one point had little dots that you can see, but you have to trust me when I say these lines actually are re represent the dots that you can't see. Um, but what we looked at was you know we took the SF36 scores for physical health on the left and mental health on the right, and actually regressed it against a sleep, a cumulative sleep, sleep score, in this case from uh, the medical outcome study, sleep study, and they came up with a problem, summary problem index. And for both physical health and for mental health, 60% of the variance between POTS patients and healthy subjects in their quality of life was accounted for by the quality of their sleep, right? So speaks to the importance of uh, the role that sleep may play in here. I know it's a common complaint among POTS patients that they're not, they don't sleep well, um, and an area that we've done some work into, but, but probably requires uh, better understanding. Um, so I guess the question is why? You know, why, why do patients have POTS to begin with? What's the underlying cause? And one of the challenges, and I alluded to this up front, is that it's not a thing. Right? It's not, there's not a specific pathophysiology that leads from A to B to C. 
where you have pots, but rather there are a whole bunch of things that can feed into that. And at the end of it, people have a presentation that we call pots, right? So Dr. David Robertson, who was my mentor at Vanderbilt, described it as the final common pathway of hundreds of genetic and acquired disorders involving the autonomic and cardiovascular system that can end up with this POTS look. And that's part of the challenge in, in treating it is that there may well be sort of different specific mechanisms that require specific treatment, but the challenge is, is, is figuring that out. Now, in some ways, this is like diagnosing someone with a fever. Um, you know, a fever is real, you can objectively measure it. Um, a fever can be treated. I mean, those of you that have had young kids, it's, it's truly amazing the you know, life altering effects that Tylenol has on babies with a fever, right? I remember my daughter when she was, I think one-ish, you know, had a fever of 102 and lay there like a rag doll, which is quite scary because usually she was running around a lot. Gave her a bit of Tylenol and I think her fever dropped to a, you know, 100 and less than 101 anyway, still febrile, but she was, you know, happy as a clam running around again, right? And so you, Tylenol, help the fever. But Tylenol didn't address the why she had the fever. And that's the point here is that the fever could be caused by viral illness, bacterial illness, cancers in some case, it's too hot outside in some cases. And there are a whole bunch of different causes that could result in that fever that the Tylenol might help. In some cases, it'll help it long enough that it'll go away by itself, in some cases not. And that's the challenge with POTS. Um, the other challenge with POTS, uh, you know, relates to the story, at least in terms of POTS research, of, of the uh, blind men and the elephant. Um, it's a story I'm sure some of you are familiar with, but I'll go through it anyway. Um, for what it's worth, there's a, a gazillion versions of this um, in, in the Indian subcontinent. Every group has a version, a slight variant of the story. Um, but yet, like a lot of great Indian things, a Brit came and stole it. Uh, and John Godby Sachs got credit for this. Uh, unlike most other British things, it's not in the British Museum, um, although that might still happen. So the story goes like this. It was six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. They conclude that the elephant is like a wall, a snake, a spear, a tree, a fan, or a rope, depending on where they touch. Right, so the challenge in POTS research is that every one of us that is involved in POTS research comes into it with our own background and our skill set, and we measure certain things. And um, pot, realistically, this is a multi-system disorder, um, and no one's able to measure everything. And part of the challenge is that you find what you look for to some extent, um, and we need to try and put that together from the different groups. So when someone says A and the other person says B, it's not that one is right and one is wrong. They may be looking at different parts of um, the so-called elephant to find the A and the B. Uh, you can see where I am on this elephant. So this is far from exhaustive, but you know, these are some common pathophysiologies that are sort of bantied around and thrown out uh, in descriptions. People talk about mast cell activation disorder, partial autonomic neuropathies, typically involving the lower extremities. Um, Julian Stewart's group uh, at New York Medical College has done a lot of work on leg blood flow measurements directly. Um, a lot of patients we studied when we were at Vanderbilt uh, were hypovolemic. They have a low blood volume that's triggering stuff. Um, and then there's issues with, with a hyperadrenergic state, right? A revved up sympathetic nervous system. Um, and, and more recently, a lot of interest in antibodies, and we're not going to touch on that in any great depth. I suspect that you have other sessions devoted very much to that. So about mast cell activation uh, disorder or syndrome, this has gotten a lot more attention lately. I, I, will, I will say that um, one of the struggles that I have is that even in the allergy mast cell community, there seem to be um, some quibbling over what you need to, to quantify this specifically. Um, broadly speaking, you know, one could argue it's this is sort of an allergy system gone awry. But there was a specific subgroup reported by my colleague uh, at Vanderbilt, Cynthia Chabal, back 15 years ago um, of patients we were seeing in clinic. And these are patients that would present with episodes of severe tachycardia associated with turning beet red. Um, and in these patients, if we actually collected 
um, a short-term urine collection. So we, instead of doing 24 hours, you would do a four-hour urine at the time of a spell um, and look for a histamine metabolite called methylhistamine in the urine. Um, some of these patients had very high levels and those patients uh, would actually respond to therapies that we wouldn't necessarily be using commonly. So in theory, um, you could use high-dose aspirin. In fact, there are some early mast cell pioneers uh, at Vanderbilt, and they used to give increasing doses of aspirin until people would have their ears ring, which is a sign of aspirin toxicity, and then they'd back off a little. And the idea is you could block some of the prostaglandins that were released from the mast cells. Um, we know the mast cells release histamine. In fact, that's what we're looking at is histamine metabolites. And so often using multimodality histamine blockers would be part of our treatment. But the interesting thing is that, you know, the, these folks that had the really revved up uh, heart rate at the time is that the mast cells actually, you know, when they granulate, they actually rev up the sympathetic nervous system. And so um, Italo Biagioni had come up with the idea of trying to sort of block this cycle at the brainstem level using alpha methyl dopa, um, which is a, a, an old school antihypertensive. It's a bit of a prickly, difficult drug to use. But in the right patient, in these patients, if, if they really were revved up, the methyl dopa would sometimes have a phenomenal effect in just calming things down. I'm gonna say a few words about um, hyperadrenergic POTS. I think when we, people talk about you know, hyperadrenergic state, we sort of assume usually that the main problem is the sympathetic nerves are just firing like crazy. And that, and that can happen in a small percentage of people without obvious provocation. It can happen in a higher percentage of people with provocation. But it's worth thinking about the fact that when you have too much of something, it can be because you're releasing too much of something or you're not getting rid of the something quickly enough. Um, and that actually has played a role in, in the POTS. Right? And so the issue at play here is uh, this is a, uh, think of this as a sympathetic nerve synapse, right? So you have the, the presynaptic nerve ending here, um, the postsynaptic nerve ending here, and you have all these receptors and we can call them alpha receptors and beta receptors. These are the things that you know, we wanna activate. You have little vesicles with red dots of norepinephrine, right? And we see that here and they get to the border and they're released. And then the norepinephrine gets released. Some of it goes and activates these receptors, but a lot of it gets sucked back up through these transporters called the norepinephrine transporters or uptake one, right? It's a clearance transporter. Now the problem is that if these norepinephrine transporters aren't working properly, then when you release the norepinephrine, less of it gets taken up by those sort of vacuum cleaners and more of them then work and linger and work on these alpha and beta receptors, right? So the net effect is you actually get an increase in sympathetic tone. Um, Maybe coming back to this, but so the relevance of this in POTS is that the only patients were genetically we know, uh, the only patients we know exactly why they develop POTS um, are sisters that have a mutation that causes this norepinephrine transporter not to work. Um, and at Vanderbilt for a while, we looked to see if this was a common cause of POTS and it wasn't outside of that family. But there are a lot of drugs, particularly neuropsychiatric drugs, um, drugs in the SNRI class, for example, that block this transporter. That's what the N stands for in SNRI is this transporter. Um, and so some of these drugs may be particularly problematic in patients with POTS because you may be making things worse by revving up sympathetic tone by accident. Um, a couple of words about the antibodies in POTS. I'm not gonna belabor this point. There are many more studies now, but this is from an early study that I was involved with, with uh, David Ken's group in Oklahoma. Um, and what we found, you know, is that um, they, had this, they had this assay where basically they took a, a, an artery, a little small little artery and put it on a little stretched out clamp, and then they'd add things to it and they could measure how much contraction there was. Um, and so uh, for control subjects, they had the artery, they sort of looked at it and, and uh, it was relatively stretched out nicely. At baseline, they gave a beta blocker, nothing happened. They gave an alpha blocker and a beta blocker, nothing happened, right? So that was sort of the baseline state. This is when they sort of added sort of, sort of serum blood from the control subject. 
When they did the same thing with the POTS patient, when they added the blood from a POTS patient, that caused the vessel to constrict, right? The diameter decreased. And they added a beta blocker and it constricted a little more. And they added an alpha blocker and it relaxed, right? And that suggested that there was something going on primarily involving activation of the alpha receptors um, in the blood of some of these POTS patients. And there are different reporting assays. They have reporter assays uh, looking at um, beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. They looked at, basically, they activated these cells and it would release um, cyclic AMP, which is what the next step, what the beta receptors do in the cells. And the point is that there was um, altered activity, uh, more stimulation of this in the POTS patients, either from Oklahoma POTS patients or the Vanderbilt POTS patients. It's a very similar finding compared to the healthy subjects. Right, so we, from this, we created a whole model of, of how um, antibodies affecting these adrenergic receptors, these adrenaline receptors, often beta receptors, could actually cause patients to develop the excess of tachycardia um, that's worse upright that we see in POTS. What I'll say is that I think there's a lot of interest uh, in these antibodies. There's work that's spread to other groups as well. Um, we're doing some work in Calgary. There's a couple of groups in Sweden that are working on this, uh, as well as uh, the Oklahoma group and a few others. Um, I don't think the answers are in, right? I think that the data would suggest that uh, there's some activation, at least in a lab-based model, that the, this, the blood or the antibody component of the blood from the POTS patients has activity on alpha and beta receptors. Um, but we're still sort of trying to sort out right now to what extent these antibodies have activities not on a lab sample, but in people, in whole people. Um, I know some of you have probably had your blood sent off to Germany to have uh, antibodies assessed uh, from Celltrend, and uh, there's another company as well um, that do this. Um, and they use uh, a type of assay called an ELISA, which basically looks for antibody fragments, um, as opposed to looking at, you know, uh, actual receptor activation. Um, and the question is, does it matter? And, and the truth is that uh, we don't know. And there's actually an ongoing study right now um, that we're involved with, led by uh, Jonas Axelson and Arthur Fedorowski, to try to compare these different approaches to try and see what's important. And then, you know, is it just these antibodies that are important? We came up with a model for how this could play a role in terms of cardiovascular activation, but there are other antibodies, lots of other antibodies, and, and do they play a role? And, and really, these are all unanswered questions at this point. A few words on um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, from the Big Pot survey, a more recent tranche, uh, we looked at this specifically, and basically about a quarter of the patients with POTS uh, reported they had uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome as well. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, and this group with the, the co-diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome were interestingly more likely to be associated with a mast cell activation syndrome. Right, again, this is survey-based. We didn't do any biological assays. Um, but it would suggest that there is an association uh, between the Ehlers-Danlos subtype and the mast cell activation. Again, it needs to be probed and understood further, but um, it's an intriguing hypothesis that needs to be looked into. Um, just a word about subtyping. Um, I get a lot of patients uh, come to clinic or contacting me, and their questions have to do with, you know, uh, approaches because they have POTS N or POTS H, hyperadrenergic or neuropathic POTS. Um, and fundamentally, I'm not sure that uh, we're at a stage where we understand what's going on enough to subtype in that way. In fact, I would argue that this type of subtyping is not only not optimal, it's, it's potentially um, harmful. So the challenge is this. Um, and I apologize if you hate Venn diagrams, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Um, I think a lot of people, when they think about hyperadrenergic POTS and neuropathic POTS, when they want to assign themselves that label, they think of the world in this way, where you have these different types of POTS that are their own distinct entities. 
but never shall really interact or touch the others. Right, but the truth is actually more like this, right, where you have some people with hyperadrenergic features, some people with neuropathic features, some people with hypovolemia, some people with two or all three of those. Right? And the truth is, if you look at a lot of the studies that have talked about hyperadrenergic POTS and neuropathic POTS, they have been very honest about what they've done if you read the methods. They often have based these criteria on specific tests. You know, if they had a standing norepinephrine level of greater than 600, they said, okay, that qualifies as hyperadrenergic. Or if they had an abnormal QSART uh, and uh, you know, abnormal skin biopsy, they said, okay, you have neur neuropathic POTS. What's not reported, because these are often reported not together, but in isolation, is that there are some patients that are in both studies, right? So I just be careful about um, being too dogmatic about uh, I have this type or that type. Hopefully, we'll be able to sort of sort out these endophenotypes uh, much more accurately in the future, but I really don't think we're there yet. Um, there are, I think, a series of talks uh, coming up uh, over the next few days on, on what to do about POTS, both pharmacological approaches, uh, non-pharmacological approaches, and, and others. So I'm not going to go into great depth about that, but just to touch on it, you know, the investigations for POTS vary. And, and the reality is that there are lots of tests that could be done, and, and some people need lots of tests and others don't. At, at the very least, I mean, everything starts off with really a thorough history and physical exam, right? You want to a lot, of, a lot of the POTS visit is trying to understand the journey and what happened, and a lot becomes clear with a, a careful history. Um, the physical exam, especially when you're wondering about uh, joint hypermobility or Ehlers-Danlos becomes more of an issue and some of the mast cell patients becomes more of an issue, um, these are important. Um, orthostatic vital signs are critical. Obviously, if you have a disorder where one of the criteria is an excess of heart rate on standing, you need to know what the heart rate is lying down and on standing within 10 minutes, um, as well as the heart rate and blood pressure for that. And then there's some very basic blood work just to make sure there's not something really overtly obvious, severe anemia, a severe electrolyte disturbance. There are actually a whole bunch of things that could be done, a few listed here, many not, but these should really all be directed based on the initial evaluation. Um, and depending on the circumstance, they can be helpful. An echocardiogram, for example, I, I'm not sure is absolutely needed in every case, but what is needed is that the physician who's making this diagnosis, who's assessing you, needs to be comfortable that your heart is structurally normal. And the reason that's important is because while we're primarily concerned about um, orthostatic tachycardia uh, in the absence of hypotension, it turns out that a similar presentation can occur in patients with a cardiomyopathy. And in the, in the demographic we see in POTS, you know, you can develop cardiomyopathy after being pregnant or in the latter stages of pregnancy. And I've certainly seen patients refer to me for POTS that developed late in pregnancy, which can happen. Um, and the problem is they had, their, they had a cardiomyopathy. Their heart muscle had actually weakened um, and the tachycardia was a reflex. And the approaches we take for cardiomyopathy and heart failure and for POTS are actually quite different, right? So they just need to be comfortable on exam that that's not what you have. Exercise assessments can be useful, especially if you're doing serial assessments over time to get an objective measure of, of exercise capacity. And as I mentioned, blood volume assessments can be useful. We did a lot of them when we were at Vanderbilt. I do less of them now because the techniques that we used at Vanderbilt aren't uh, Health Canada approved. Um, but a lot of the POTS patients, uh, upwards of 70%, um, but not 100% have a low blood volume, and, and that may be important in terms of how we approach the POTS. In terms of the treatment approaches, um, broadly defined, uh, exercise training is, is really a, a key component. Um, strategies to increase blood volume are important. Then there's some hemodynamic agents we use, pills we'll use, either initially depending on someone's symptoms or after we try some of these other approaches. Um, and behavioral therapies, and I think there's a session on that coming up as well at some point. In terms of exercise, um, you know, there's pretty good data. The best data is, is, is out of uh, the Dallas study, but there are a few other studies that have looked at this. Um, and, uh, you know, the data shows that exercise training improves fitness levels, improves blood volume, improves cardiac remodeling, normalizes sympathetic nerve activity, 
all of which are things that are of interest to me as a human physiology researcher, probably not a lot of interest to you as a patient, um, except that these things then lead to a reduction in the orthostatic tachycardia. And most importantly, these were associated with an improvement in quality of life. Um, the studies, the initial studies were small, but you know, it, that's ultimately what we're going for is all the other things we're talking about are really trying to help restore quality, um, restore people's qualities of lives. So there are different approaches. I know, um, I think DI may have sort of the modified, the CHOP modified approach on their site and it's certainly available on the web. You can actually get the original calendars that they used in the Dallas study available on the web. Um, quite frankly, that those are too complicated for me to read and understand. Um, I've taken the approach that there are some underlying principles that have come out of the Dallas study and, and most patients are able to really take this and adapt this to their life because everyone's life and access to technology and access to time are different. Um, so the first is that this training program is really focused primarily on uh, aerobic reconditioning, right? This is primarily cardiovascular reconditioning. There's a little bit of resistance training focused on thigh muscles to bulk up a little just so you know, the muscle actually acts as a fluid reservoir, but it's primarily aerobic. The exercise has to be regular pretty much every other day, and the sessions have to be 30-minute sessions fairly quickly to start getting benefit. Um, now, if you were to say, well, isn't two days a week better than nothing? The answer is probably yes, right? But to really get the training benefit, it needs to be more regular. The most clever thing that was done in the Dallas study was that they banned upright exercises initially. It's not that upright exercises are bad. If you can do those other things that we talked about every other day, 30 minute sessions, um, you know, running on a treadmill, then go for it, right? But most people can't, right? The, 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 the reason, um, you know, you're diagnosed with POTS is that you have symptoms when you're upright before you exercise. And, and often there's a huge exercise intolerance component that gets accentuated even more so when you're upright. So the idea was not to waste the heartbeats on the gravity, but to invest it in the exercise. And so the modalities preferred were the use of a rowing machine or recumbent cycles or swimming. And the truth is that which is best depends on where you are and, and what you have access to. Truthfully, in Calgary, we had snow this week. Um, the outdoor pool is really not useful, right? So you're looking at rowing machines or recumbent cycles. When I was in Nashville, lot, many more outdoor pools that, that may have been a more viable strategy. The key, the other key thing about the exercise is you have to give it time, right? Lots of POTS patients would come to me in clinic and say, you know, if I try and exercise, I can't get out of bed for two days. Um, and I've heard enough people say it that I believe it. I believe entirely that they're telling the truth. Um, and some started the exercise program and we talked to them after the Dallas study and they come back and say, it didn't work for me. I just, I just felt worse. Um, and so when I contacted the people in Dallas, they said, oh yeah, we had that too. They just didn't write about it, right? So you know, people got better, felt better by the end of the study, but it can take four or five, even six weeks to start seeing the benefits from the exercise training. Um, and in that time, you can actually feel worse. Think of it as the sort of going through the valley of death, so to speak. There's a period of time where it's worse, but if you stick with it, you can get to the other side where you start feeling better as opposed to feeling worse with the exercise. In terms of increasing blood volume, um, you know, we've You've heard about sort of the water uh, and salt approach. The truth is that the, there hasn't historically been a lot of great data for the, the salt loading, um, but it's coming, right? And we've done some of that work at Vanderbilt. We've presented it. The paper is being submitted this fall for publication. Um, loading up on salt does what we think it does, right? It increases uh, plasma volume. It lowers upright norepinephrine. It lowers heart rate. It does exactly what we think it does. Um, so increase your salt. I'm a big, I'm a much bigger fan of doing this with diet than with tablets. It can usually be done. It's often better tolerated. Um, fludrocortisone can be used. Octreotide can be used. I don't use that often. Um, IV saline, uh, we'll say a word about that. And that is that it acutely, it helps, right? I mean, this data is from the late nineties. Um, you can see here that the Orthostatic tachycardia before the saline was, was 30, well over 30 beats a minute. It dropped to about 15, 16 beats a minute, right? With a liter of saline. So acutely, I'm a big fan of this, right? That means that if you end up in the emergency room, you've decompensated, doctors think you bring you into hospital. My advice is always try a liter or two of saline 
before making the final decision, right? Most people will get better enough, not cured, but better enough that they can go home, feel well enough to go home. Um, chronic sailing is a different issue, right? The, the problem isn't the sailing usually, occasionally it is, usually it's not. The problem is, is how you access the veins, right? I mean, if you, you can't get peripheral veins regularly um, without losing them, and then you get into, you go into a sliding, a slippery slope, I guess, of, of requiring central venous access, and that has its own problems. In terms of hemodynamic agents, um, you know, there's some data from mitodrin that it helps, uh, perhaps in some subgroups more than others. Um, we're big fans of propranolol, and this stems from my days at Vanderbilt where we tested a whole bunch of drugs, and inevitably, including among patients that said they didn't tolerate beta blockers, propranolol would win. And by win, I mean it lowered their standing heart rate, it lowered their orthostatic tachycardia, and it improved their symptoms. Dr. Raj just wanted to give you a heads up on time so we can still do Q&A. Okay, I'm almost done, actually. Great. Right, so the key with propranolol is not to give too much, right? So we tend to use low doses in POTS patients, um, and uh, we tested a full dose of beta blockade, the 80 milligrams, and what we found was that we went to the higher doses, some of the benefits started going away. So use little doses of propranolol, low dose propranolol we found to be helpful. Um, Pyridostigmine or mestinon, uh, lower heart rate as well. The truth is not, not as efficiently as a beta blocker, it's not as potent, but it too provided some benefit and improvement in symptoms. And uh, Blair Grubbs Group has published a large series that most patients got better with it, um, but about 20% didn't tolerate it, almost all because of cramping and diarrhea. So if you're prone to that, don't use it. Um, we'll skip along and just, you know, say, you know, the, the key take home messages about POTS are that it's a chronic disorder, it's associated with significant disability, but it's not a disease, it's not a single disease. There are actually multiple pathophysiologies at play, um, and that's part of the challenge. The treatment approaches consists of exercise training as an important component, strategies to in induce blood volume expansion, starting with salt and water, but maybe using drugs as well, and then approaches uh, to control heart rate, and then and also as a patient, learning to live with a chronic illness. I don't think, uh, I certainly don't have any ways of making this go away. I don't know that anyone I'll speak to you over the next few days is gonna make this magically go away. It's a matter of you know, trying to control it as much as possible and then learning to live your life as opposed to letting it control your life. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. You always give such wonderful lectures. We have a ton of questions coming in for you. So um, we're gonna try to answer as many as we can. We have people on the back end trying to answer them. So. Look at Dr. Um, Sheldon working on it. Yes, Dr. Sheldon's working on it. Dr. Raj, if you have time afterwards to help answer some questions, we would be so grateful. Um, but let's answer a couple live. Um, my first question is, um, is there any research about people with POTS feeling worse in the mornings and better later in the day? For example, from laying down all night, sleeping and taking longer to get body regulated throughout the day. Um, so we, I don't know how much research there is on sort of the symptoms. Um, that is certainly absolutely true and probably more clear in the patients with orthostatic hypotension, right? If you look at the, the people with, you know, autonomic failure, I'd say 90% of them are worse first thing in the morning. What we do know about the POTS patients are that when we've looked at, you know, the heart rate, the orthostatic tachycardia and the standing heart rates, that there's a diurnal variability where the standing heart rate is higher first thing in the morning and it normalizes or goes down by midday and then sort of stays at a slightly lower level, which has some implications in terms of meeting the threshold criteria. If you get assessed in an afternoon clinic versus first thing in the morning, it may well be different. Um, and one could postulate that the higher heart rate may correlate with worse symptoms. Okay, great, thank you. Um, how does dysautonomia affect the blood vessels, arteries, veins? Um, not sure. So I'm not sure if there's a sort of a direct uh, effect where the vessels are damaged, right? But, but some of the stuff we're talking about, these alpha and beta receptors I was talking about earlier, these are um, receptors that encourage blood vessels to squish or open up um, and dilate a little bit, right? And so 
uh, you know, I think, you know, it, it affects the regulation of the vessels and that affects how the, both the blood pressure, but perhaps more importantly, how they squish or don't squish to get blood coming back to the heart, right? And so some of the drugs like mitodrin, you know, probably works largely by getting your veins to squish better to get more blood coming back to the heart to, you know, then, you know, improve the forward flow. Perfect. Um, so we have a lot of questions on um, blood volume. Oh, where'd my question go? Um, how would a doctor test your specific blood volume? So there, the, the FDA approved test, there's a, there's a, the tests typically involve a small amount of radioactivity. So they're done in nuclear medicine labs in hospitals. The ones we used at Vanderbilt, both on the research and clinical side, uh, it was by a company called Daxor that had a commercial kit where they had albumin, which is the protein that we all have in our blood, um, tagged with a little bit of radio iodine, radio labeled iodine. And so they'd do what's basically what's called an indicator dye dilution method, right? So if you had a bucket of red dye and dumped it in your bathtub, it would turn really red. If you took that same bucket of dye and dumped it in Lake Ontario, you know, you'd be lucky to get a little haze of pink, right? And so the idea is that if you know how much red dye you dumped in, in this case, you know how much of the radio iodine you dumped in to the person, and then you do blood samples and measure the activity afterwards, you can now calculate what the volume that you dumped into was, which is your plasma volume. And then you can infer your overall blood volume from that. Right? So the short answer is the techniques involve going to nuclear medicine labs. Not every hospital has it, but a reasonable number of hospitals do in the States. Test isn't approved in Canada. So we, we never, you know, the Health Canada never approved that test. So I don't have access to that now. Got it. Thank you. Um, what is your theory to explain cognitive impairment related to POTS and why does it not go away or improve um, while standing up or supine position? Sorry. So, um, yeah, don't know. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's probably complicated. I mean, some of it may be the higher levels of sympathetic tone or sort of, you know, the norepinephrine level and the norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter in the brain and may be doing other things. Um, there may be lots of stuff going on. In fact, we just put in a grant this last week um, to CIHR, the much poorer northern cousin of NIH, to try and study this. And I think DI has actually funded a study in England looking at fMRIs to try and look at brain activity, to try and understand this. But the question about why doesn't it go away when lying down, the answer is it probably does to some extent, right? It doesn't go away completely, but if you ask the question another way, which is, is it worse when you're upright? The answer for most people is yes, right? They're thinking, they may argue, isn't perfect when they're lying down, but if they stand up, it gets even worse, right? So there is probably a positional component to it. All right. Um, I think we got a, time for a couple more. If you're deconditioned, what types of muscles should we work on? Um, I know aerobic will help, but which muscles should we work on specifically? The heart. Right. I mean, so really, so there are two things about the exercise training program, right? The, the, the resistance work, right, is basically thigh muscles. And the reason for that's not about the deconditioning. The reason for that is to sort of have, and the reality is that's probably not critically important for everyone, but there are some, like I'd say on average, if I had to pick POTS patients as being overweight like me or underweight, on average, I'd say they're underweight, right? They tend to be slightly built. Um, and some have very little visible muscle bulk. And in that group in particular, some resistance work to build up muscle bulk is probably important because the muscle acts as a fluid reservoir, skeletal muscle does. But most of the aerobic training is actually working on altering heart dynamics, right? The exercise improves blood volume, but also improves stroke volume and cardiac chamber size. And that's actually the main effect, I think. Not the, it's not a matter of toning up your arms or toning up your legs primarily. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, is a person less likely to recover from POTS the longer they have had their symptoms? Um, like, is it irreversible depending on how long they've had it? Yeah. So, so certainly I think if, you know, if, if someone has had these symptoms for a week or two, I think there's a good chance it'll go away, but we wouldn't call them POTS because it's not chronic, right? But once it's chronic, I guess the question is how often does it totally go away? And the truth is there's not good data on that. 
in the patients I've seen in the adult world, which who almost by definition have had it for at least six to 12 months, if not longer, um, I don't know of anyone I've cured of POTS, right? There are people that we make better. I think the majority we can make somewhat better and more functional, but you know, how many, and, and some are not on drugs, right? Some with exercise and salt and water can function well without drugs, but I don't know of anyone that is cured. The pediatricians, there's some literature claiming that they get cured, but the data is not great. Uh, what I've never been sure of is whether the patients outgrow their POTS or whether they outgrow their pediatricians. <laughs> and don't see them anymore. Right, right. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, it says, Dr. Raj, I have noticed POT symptoms are often worse during menstruation with increased syncope episodes. Is there a way to lessen the symptoms during this time? Um, so it's a good observation, and we've actually published some data that, that there's more lightheadedness in women with or without POTS, actually, around the time of menstruation. Um, obviously, the, the lightheadedness is worse in the POTS patients, and the risk of syncope is worse overall. So how do you avoid it? Uh, as silly as it sounds, by avoiding your period, right? So there are some patients that will go on long-term birth control. Um, I know one of the brands is Seasonal. Some use you know, IUDs with birth control where they just have it less frequently. The Seasonal, you still have breakthrough bleeds, but I think it's every three or four months instead of every month. So it's not that you don't have the lightheadedness around your period, but you have it fewer times a year. All right. Perfect. Um, so I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh